<laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, so a call for public comment with the request that it be kept quick because we lost some time. <laughs> Does anyone in the public have comment? Okay, hearing none, um, I would like to move to approving the minutes. Uh, did everyone get a chance to see the minutes? Nope. I, I move we approve the minutes. Do we have a second? I, sec I second, Louis. Rich, Paris Lady seconds. Uh, do we, any discussion? Okay, hearing none, I will call the roll uh, uh, on the, the vote to approve the minutes. Eric Winkler? Approved. Uh, Marissa Elkins? Yes. Deb Clemmer? Yes. Louis Hasbrook? Yes. Patrick McCarthy? Yes. Angie Gregory? Yes. Uh, and me? Yes. Okay. Um, and that allows us to uh, get our great presentations uh, that uh, I'm looking forward to and Angie and I are looking forward to digging into more uh, from uh, uh, Alex Barron's uh, teams of Smith College students. Um, and the first one on the agenda is Gear Up Northampton with Seychelle Brainerd, Lucy Hartley, and John Rosenthal. And I think if they're going to share uh, any slides, we'll need to make one of them a, um, a host or co-host. Uh, do- I've, I've made everyone <laughs> oh wow okay uh yeah. so is anyone from that group <laughs> yeah hi hi great oh okay you're there together great yeah thanks guys um, um so take it away great let me just share my screen can everyone see yes so, awesome um great so our capstone presentation focused on project focused on improving bike connectivity and safety in Northampton. Um, the problem that was brought to us by Ben was that Kappa is currently looking for ways to improve um, bike safety and connectivity. Um, and our primary consideration was that given the current picture Main Street redesign project, um, the city lacks the resources and time to invest in implementing permanent bike infrastructure um, such as protected lanes. So therefore we focused mostly on utilizing safer roadways to connect cyclists with their destinations. So this is our table of contents. So why bike? Um, biking is a really great alternative to carbon centered transportation, um, which are primary producers of particulate matter air pollution, which have led to this climate crisis in addition to public health concerns. Um, therefore, we need there's a need for zero carbon transportation. For example, Copenhagen, Denmark has already implemented this as 56% of residents commute via bike, which has led to an annual reduction of 90,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, electric vehicles are frequently brought up as an alternative. However, they are financially inaccessible and carry additional environmental costs with their manufacturing and charging. Um, additionally, we've seen increased bike mobility and access in recent years. However, many urban areas lack the infrastructure to really make this a possibility. Although biking results in greater emission greater reductions in emissions, equitable access to bike infrastructure has remained a problem. Historically, bike infrastructure has been predominantly implemented in white wealthy areas, even though marginalized communities often face disproportionate exposure to particulate matter. <clears throat> this segregation by way of transportation exacerbates inequalities by fostering the social exclusion of minority communities. Given the prevalence of environmental racism, we strove to incorporate environmental justice as we approach this problem. Another factor limiting the widespread use of cycling commuting is safety. In recent years, 2.4% of all road fatalities have been cyclists, despite them representing only 0.4% of the mode share. 
This discrepancy between use and crashes really highlights the insufficiency of the current infrastructure. In Rockhampton specifically, there is an average of 15.3 bike related crashes every year. Although the city has invested significant time and money in building bike infrastructure, most notably the rail trail, there are still high numbers of crashes. In the past 20 years, we can see that there have been over 250 traffic related traffic incidents involving cyclists. This number is greater than those involving pedestrians, despite walking being a much more common mode of transportation. Besides the rail trail, Northampton does have bike infrastructure, which is painted or protected bike lanes. Painted bike lanes are pavement markings that increase the visibility of cyclists. In Northampton, this is either a green painted lane or a bicycle marker painted in a lane. Comparatively, protected bike lanes are designated spaces for cyclists that physically separate them from both vehicular traffic and pedestrians. There are protected bike lanes on segments of King Street and Pleasant Street, but the city does primarily re rely on painted bike lanes. Implementing a comprehensive bike network will also help the city achieve its climate goals. Northampton aims to be carbon neutral by 2050 with the benchmark goal of cutting emissions in half by 2030. A transportation mode shift will help the city achieve these goals as currently 26% of the city's emissions are through vehicle transportation and 62% of residents commute to work alone via car. As Lucy mentioned, uh, Northampton is currently in the process of rede redesigning Main Street, the primary road that runs through downtown Northampton. As you probably know, the current working design includes protected bike lanes on either side of Main Street that physically separate the cyclists from traffic. The downtown area is a particularly dangerous and confusing region for cyclists, so this will really help improve safety, mobility, and sustainability. However, given the scope of this project, it is difficult for the city to focus on implementing other bike infrastructure projects at the moment. Um, so because of this, we started off um, with a project goal of identifying community centers, and we used data from the National Household Travel Survey, which identified key areas that need to be accessible by a bit bike infrastructure. This includes like hospitals, parks, schools, libraries, the list goes on. And to have a more community focus, we use the housing and human services list on the Northampton city government website to identify further resources like the Northampton Survival Center, the VA, um, just informing our justice outlook. We then wanted to prioritize accessibility. So thinking about this project of who does not currently have access to bike infrastructure in Northampton and how can our project help to remedy this? Um, and we wanted to design safe, connective, and low traffic bike routes. So we used data from where all of the recent crashes have been in Northampton, as well as which roads are more frequently trafficked. And we tried to avoid these areas to get to our key destinations in more safe manners. Finally, we wanted to provide a foundation for a permanent bike network um, with permanent infrastructure. Um, and though we know that this is not a solution for right now, we wanted to open this conversation for the future. And so in terms of methodology, we started with client meetings. Our client is the Northampton City Government, specifically Ben Wheel. Um, and as Seychelles and Lucy have mentioned, we learned through this that given the redesign, there is not the, the policy window is not open for high cost and permanent infrastructure, which meant that all of our recommendations will be focused on low cost and painted infrastructure. We then did a literature review, which cities have implemented this in the past, how has it worked, and how have they measured success. We identified Davis, California and Victoria, Canada as two cities that we really wanted to use as examples for this project and found that by their results showed that by lowering vehicular speeds, trying to decrease traffic and creating designated spaces for bike infrastructure, it will lead to more um, community um, participation in the biking as a mode chair. We then used um, the GIS layers that I previously mentioned, as well as some other layers about key resources to determine um, how to map these, these bike routes. And we started with pencil to paper, trying to figure out these routes. We then visited these routes in car, which led to a lot of rethinking and rerouting. Um, and then we visited by bike to see if these streets were actually bikeable and safe. Finally, we used Google My Maps, which was the easiest interface to use um, in order to map these routes and upload them to ArcGIS. And so what do these recommendations look like? We created nine routes that link 50 key resources in Northampton. This is just a broad overview. 
Um, but to get a little bit deeper into what this actually looks like is that we wanted to build off of the current infrastructure, bike infrastructure in Northampton, um, mainly the rail trail. Uh, and as you see here, the purple line depicts the rail trail. And so how to use these routes is that you will start on the purple line and follow these blue routes until you get to your desired destination. Um, as you can tell, these routes are definitely not the most direct. If you plug in how to get somewhere in Google Maps, this is not the route you will take. Um, route five, you would head past along Child's Park and up Elm Street. However, this is a very high crash zone. Um, so we wanted to make sure to avoid these zones. By taking our routes, specifically by taking Route 5, um, you will be avoiding 5.64 crash zones on average to get to your desired resource on this list. And by taking Route 7, which connects the VA Medical Center and a lot of destinations on Pine Street, you'll be avoiding an average of two crash zones to get to each resource. Next, we wanted to analyze how effective and convenient our routes are and how we can possibly analyze the success of a bike network. For this an to analyze this, we looked at our proposed routes and then compared them for the most direct route between the key destination and the entrance to the bike trail as recommended to us by Google Maps. Through this analysis, we found that there is a 19.6% increase between the direct routes and the safe routes, which is a 0.2 mile increase and corresponds to a 0.76 minute increase. So there's less than a one minute increase when you take the safer routes. The most important metrics we were looking at was safety. And we found that there is a 36.4% decrease in the number of crashes between the direct routes on, and the safe routes. So on the safer routes, there are 1.6 less, less crashes. We also want to provide the city of Northampton with ways in which they could quantify and the success and limitations of any potential bike network that they might implement. However, accurately quantifying this can be difficult because there's a multitude of factors that add up into the success of a bike network. These factors include frequency, mode share, perceived safety, equity and access, public sentiment, and comfort levels. We found four tools that when combined create a pretty comprehensive analysis of changes in these factors. These include surveys, GPS tracking, permanent pedestrian and bike counters, and social media. So we also did a bike dock analysis um, during this project, which just we looked at data from the EPA on environmental justice communities in Northampton, specifically low income communities. And we wanted to overlay this with the Valley bike docks to see if um, these communities have access. And as you can see, there are bike docks located in two of these three environmental justice sectors. However, there are not bike docks located in the top left sector, though there are some in close proximity. Um, this is interesting because this is where the Meadowbrook apartment complex is located, which is some of the largest, or one of the largest low income housing communities in Northampton. So when putting in, installing future bike docks, it's gonna be really important to put them in the Meadowbrook apartments or other low income communities in Northampton to make sure that communities that have been historically underserved um, by bike infrastructure have access. All right, now for some of the limitations of this project, um, first of all, there were several areas that remain unconnected, primarily King Street, the area around Cooley Dickinson and connecting to Bay State Village and Elm Street. Um, these areas are high, they have high um, traffic volume, the cars are traveling at a very high speed and um, the shoulders are pretty narrow. So it isn't a great um, situation for bikers. So these green lines um, represent proposed routes for protected infrastructure when city time and budget allows. Um, additionally on King Street, even though the rail trail runs parallel to it at times, there are very few exit points in this area, um, making it really difficult to get to the key areas on King Street. Um, additionally, the area around Cooley Dickinson Hospital is really complicated to navigate on bike and an additional high crash zone. So that is another recommendation for permanent infrastructure. And lastly, Elm Street is a really direct way to connect to downtown and all of the services in that area. And although there are already painted bike lanes on Elm Street, there are still a lot of crashes indicating the need for a higher level of protection for cyclists. Additionally, on our routes, um, as much as we tried to avoid them, there are some dangerous areas for cyclists to be aware of 
during their travels, exiting the bike path to get to Fruit Street, um, you have to cross a dangerous intersection. Jackson Street is a really narrow and there's not a great shoulder to travel on. Um, and additionally on Chapel Street, um, connecting to the housing in that and services in that area is really dangerous as well. So our project conclusions, we can created nine routes to connect 50 key services with about 15 and a half miles of bike path. Um, we just wanna reemphasize that this is a first step towards improved bike culture and infrastructure in the city. So when we can invest in permanent protected infrastructure, there are people there ready to use it. Um, we located and designed routes on safe streets to reroute cyclists and identified ideal areas for protected lanes. Um, some future work in this area, um, we would want to look into qualitative data, asking people who are commuting via bike in Northampton, what are common origin points and other key areas to connect we may have missed in our initial analysis, um, access to bikes and valley bike docks, um, if we create this infrastructure, who does it ultimately serve? What types of infrastructure do cyclists value? Do they like one type of protected lane over another? Things like that. And lastly, this would all be done with some level of community input and workshopping. So thank you to Alex, Ben, the city of Northampton, Beth, Heather and Kalai, and our three 12 cohort, and just especially all of you for sitting in and listening to this project. Yeah. Um, if anyone has questions. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I think that the conventional way is to have uh, council members uh, ask questions or commissioners ask questions first, and then we can open up to the public too. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Yeah, I've, this is Eric Winkler. I have a, um, just a, qu a question about some of the research that you did in developing this do you have a sense or were you able to find information about how many people commute from northampton to uh, amherst uh, via bike many many years ago that was my commute and uh, i actually always found that uh, biking was faster than cars on route nine um so i'm, I'm interested in that because um you know there's some different ways to get to the campus from the river um, and I'm just, I'm just curious if you have any data to support the connectivity, because it's one thing to just sort of in Northampton, that's fine. Uh, but, uh, there's a lot of people that drive across that bridge. Um, I don't know, 20, 40,000 cars a day, something like that. Um, so have you done any looking into that, those numbers? Yeah, the primary scope of our project, I will say, was in Northampton specifically, given this being a semester project. But there was a report that analyzed um, that specific section of the rail trail, the one that goes specifically from Amherst to Northampton. Um, I don't have any of the numbers off the top of my head, but um, we'd be happy to share that report with you. It was very interesting. Yeah, I will say, I think the counters were from the Friends of Northampton Rail Trail, but they only collected data, I think, on two different days. So it's a very like limited scope of the data that they do have. Yep, that, that was us. Yeah, yeah I'd, like, I'd like to get a copy of the, um, the presentation. I'm a, I'm a big cyclist. I ride my bicycle four times as much as I move my automobile. So um, this, is, this is good. And uh, uh, safety is definitely important because people don't pay attention and they look at their cell phones too much in the car. Mm -hmm. Of course, definitely. We'll be happy to share all of our report findings um, once we finish our final paper. Uh, are there any other commissioner questions or comments? Um, or implication thoughts that you want to share? Uh, Louis. I'd just like to say it's it, it's a very in, involved and intricate presentation, and I truly appreciated it. Um, I learned I learned things today, and uh, that's that's always a treat. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any comments or questions from the public? Well, in that case, I, I want to echo Louis 
heartily, I, you know, I really appreciate the work that you did. There's so much detail in there that we can actually apply. Um, and we can, you've given us a, a method so that we can, whether we do it or we ask another cohort of Smith College students to do it, we can kind of expand it again, as, as you pointed out for some of the future work. So I'm, um, I'm really hopeful about this. And you pointed out places where we just have no choice but to invest in uh, protected infrastructure. And that's hey, also hey, can I just chime in one one more sure. thing? You know, there's a there's a cycling club in town, and there are people that ride. My 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 riding experience is sort of down to where the potholes are. I can identify them on a lot of roads. I know I know where they are because I ride I ride them so much. So, I think. Going going forward, I think having a, a meaningful discussion with people that ride every day and know the roads, because I could see some of the routes that you were picking. I think I could think of better routes, um, potentially that are less less trafficy. But the other thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, it's it's um the infrastructure in itself in terms of uh, painted lines or barriers. That's just one piece of it. How about paving the roads and filling potholes that's that's a that's another piece of the safety that mm -hmm. is is very important i have a close friend who's now paralyzed because he hit a pothole and and damaged his his spinal cord so that on add that on top of this because it's not just painting lines uh jackson street is narrow but jackson street has some really bad potholes right um near a prospect so you know though it's not just enough that it's you know narrow now we have potholes to contend with too which makes a narrow road even more narrow so i'm happy to have a conversation with anybody about this too because this is you know i spend half my day riding my bike around town or around the area well, well you're lucky to have so much riding time um <laughs> but um it, what i will say is is i know that the tpc is meeting tomorrow and I intend to share uh, the, Jonna and Lucy uh, uh, the, this team's work with them and widely. And it's going to require a lot of pushing from people like you, Eric, to move this to the next uh, level. So yes, we, we will have to reach out to a lot. Um, okay, I, the next team is uh, greening green spaces, uh, Isabel, Kieran, and Isabella. And uh, I think if you've already also been given co-hosting ability, you should, there you are. Let's see. Yeah. You guys still see it? We see it loading. Oh. Nothing. Uh, it's still loading, but but on your side, you actually see it, huh? Yeah. Um, oh wait, wait. How about this? Yes. Okay. I see it. Awesome. Nice. Hey. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Isabel. Isabella. Kieran. Very unique names. Um, and our project is Green and Green Spaces, and we made an action plan to optimize city-owned grass green spaces in Northampton. Um, so this is a little hard because we did this in person, but yesterday presenting to the Smith community, we asked how many of you agreed that this is a commonly idealized version of an American household? You can turn off your mic or I can just go on yesterday's data. Um, so yesterday, a lot of people agreed that this is a commonly idealized American household. And then I asked them how many of you agreed that the grass lawn was a key feature of this idealized American household. And the majority of people raised their hands again. Um, so this, there's clearly a pattern here. The National Association of Landscape Professionals found that around 81% of Americans have grass lawns. So something so widespread and prevalent in the US needs to make sure that its existence is sustainable and not just traditional or aesthetically pleasing. It's going to be increasingly important as, as climate change increases weather variability and global temperatures are rising. Um, it's going to increase the need for infrastructure resiliency and highlight the need for resource efficiency. 
So in our very own Northampton, CAPA, the Climate Action and Project Administration reached out to us um, because they highlighted some grievances about from the community on city-owned grass lawns. They found that there are certain lawns that were mowed regularly, but were infrequently used and seemed like an unnecessary nuisance of noise and air pollution, so not very optimal. Um, so they came to us with a project where we researched and recommended alternative vegetation for these green spaces. Um, and beyond just limiting noise and air pollution, this is gonna be increasingly important for climate resilience. Um, as climate change worsens, adapting and upgrading infrastructure, including green infrastructure like green spaces, will become vital. Grass isn't a very resilient plant, especially because it's not native to the area. It requires a lot of water, a lot of mowing, which means a lot of gas emissions for the mowing. And it's gonna be important to adapt these spaces as climate change worsens. The community had also expressed, the community members who expressed some grievances about frequently mowed spaces, but infrequently used, they expressed interest in turning these spaces into pollinator habitats. We found this com particularly compelling because all 400 species of bees are in decline and 40% of pollinator species risk, risk extinction. Um, so all of this together led us to our main goal of adapting city-owned green spaces in Northampton to become pollinator habitats, less maintenance intensive, and climate resilient. So a little road map of what we're going to be going over today is a status quo overview of grassland green spaces, our project goals, our methodology, how we did this, our recommendations for these spaces, the limitations we face for our project, and the next steps. So turf grass lawns um, are a category of grass designed to be stepped on repeatedly and thus need to be mowed regularly. This is this comprises the majority of green city owned green spaces and city owned like lawns. Um, so we want to look we want to look at the sustainability of it in terms of economic sustainability. We estimated it cost around two hundred thousand dollars per year to maintain these grass lawn and green spaces. Um, in terms of labor and maintenance sustainability we found it wasn't the most sustainable because it needs, some grass lawns need to be mowed every day, some every couple of days, other every two weeks, but this is still all very frequently that they need to be mowed. Um, so this is very labor intensive. And for fertilization, it needs to be fertilized every six to eight weeks. For mowing, fertilization and aeration, another maintenance process, these are all very labor intensive processes and very time consuming because they all need to be manually done even with a lawnmower you still need to be driving the lawnmower or pushing the lawnmower um, in terms of resource sustainability it's very water intensive it's not native to the area and it's not drought resistant so there are two possibilities for climate change one is that precipitation inches will increase and the other that there could be um, more bouts of dry periods um, so the grass isn't going to be very resilient to that so already they're a pretty water intensive crop. Um, they also need fertilizer, gas, labor, and those all have costs. You have to buy a lot of fertilizer, a lot of gas because they're constantly mowing and then labor. So these are also very resource intensive. And then if you consider pollinators a resource, it's just a poor pollinator habitat. Um, turf grass lawns are a monoculture, which means it's just one species that are occupying the area and pollinators aren't a huge fan of that. In terms of pollution sustainability, um, 26.7 million tons of pollutant in the US are attributed to grass and gardening maintenance equipment, particularly lawnmowers. Um, and then 24 to 45% of all non-road gasoline emissions are from lawnmowers and lawn maintenance. So it's not very sustainable in terms of how much pollution it emits. Um, so our goal is that by adapting existing city-owned grass green spaces, Northampton will increase their climate resiliency. Um, they will improve their air quality, reduce noise pollution for lawnmowers, increase biodiversity, all while cutting down on costs and creating a general better quality of life for the Northampton community. So our process. We first did a literature review on lawn conversion projects in um in general, and um, did research on uh, ground cover uh, possibilities. We then met with field experts, um, including James Thompson, the GIS coordinator, uh, Gabby Emmerman of the Smith Botanic Garden, uh, Beth Hucker, director of seeds, and Rich Parasoliti, um, the Department of Public Works superintendent. Um, these meetings were to help narrow our, the scope of our project and to determine um, pilot sets.
<clears throat> we then conducted two series of site visits um, in Northampton to uh, various grass green spaces around the city. And then from there selected our three pilot sites um, for our, uh, our tiered recommendations. Um, this is a map of all city owned existing grass green spaces that can be adapted by implementing some of our pilot recommendations that we will go into um, later on. It, um, with Jane's help, we accessed the data for tax exempt um, the layer of tax exempt uh, spaces in Northampton, and then from there selected uh, city owned green spaces. Um, then we went through, uh, looked at the aerial data and took away the spaces that were not a majority of grass cover. Um, and from there sorted by size using a green color gradient, the lightest being the smallest size and the darkest being the largest sized. Um, so choosing sites. We first removed all non-city owned um, spaces uh, like schools, cemeteries, and athletic fields um, because there were certain restrictions on what we could do there. Um, we then did analysis of the aerial imagery um, on the map and from there uh, did site visits um, and then chose uh, sites from each different size category. We ended up um, choosing a site from a small size category, a medium size, and then a large size. Um, while the smaller spaces are in total not large in size, um, mowing these spaces we found um, is an unnecessary use of, or of expense. So our tier recommendations, um, for each of our three sites we provided three tiers of recommendations, the um, lowest cost and lowest intervention being level one and the highest cost and highest intervention being level three. Um, all suggested sites would eventually require less maintenance than the status quo. Um, similarly to solar panels, um, after initial um, cost of implementation, these processes will be lower cost um, long-term. Yeah, so the first site that we chose is the Industrial Drive Roundabout. Uh, and our first suggestion in the first tier would be to stop mowing or to mow less frequently. This is not an area that has a lot of high foot traffic, so we were less concerned about things such as ticks coming in contact with people. Our second level would be to see the area with white clover. This is something that would benefit pollinators. This is a relatively inexpensive intervention, which is why it's in level two. So it'd be about 10 to $20 per acre for something of this size. And once it, the clover is seeded and is growing, you would only need to mow it about two times a year. This can be mixed in with grass, meaning you would not have to remove the turf grass that is already present there. And uh, white clover is also more drought tolerant than turf grass. And once the white clover is planted, this space would no longer require fertilization or pesticide use. In addition, white clover is unlikely to compete with the trees that you can see in this image. Uh, a level three intervention, meaning that it would have a much more significant initial cost, would be to have a Miyawaki forest. Uh, you can see in the picture here, the first one done in the Northeast in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is about, uh, these can be as small as five meters, which is about two parking spaces. And they're also known as a micro forest. And the method for doing this is to use only native plant species to mix in organic material into the soil before beginning any seedling, seeding and to densely plant native tree and shrub species very close together, about three seeds per square meter, which would then compete with each other. In about two to three years, this forest would then be entirely self-sufficient and no longer require maintenance. And of course, since this is a roundabout, we would advise adding traffic signs for safety. Uh, we understood from the Department of Public Works there have been concerns about people driving through the roundabout. So having this forest there could also, in fact, maybe help with road safety. So a little bit more about the benefits of doing a Miyawaki forest is that this can sequester carbon, reduce air pollution, improve water absorption. It can be a buffer against flooding and erosion, and it can help mitigate the urban heat island effect. And while the initial cost is heavy, again, eventually once the forest is self-sufficient, it would require no further maintenance by the city. Our second site that we chose from the medium size category is Ray Ellerbrook Field. A level one intervention could take place here uh, in the areas that are shaded. 
And we would recommend clover seeding here, which again can help decrease mow frequency while not out competing the turf grasses in the area. Our second level would be a low intensity version of meadowscaping. And then our third level would be a high, taking place here, like behind the athletic fields. And our third level would be a higher intensity version of meadowscaping, which I'll get into more detail, uh, which we would recommend taking place uh, in the same areas as the clover seeding, if this level were chosen. So for the lower, sorry, just, oh, sorry. One moment. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Can everyone see? Yep. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so for the second level of meadowscaping, to just get into a little bit more detail, we would recommend first minimizing mowing. And then you would have to remove about 80% of the turf grass there and re- uh, supplant the soil with organic material. Then you would seed in native wildflowers. And we, for this intervention, one of the reasons that it is a lower level is we are not recommending changing areas of high foot traffic, meaning that you would not need to be concerned about grass coming in contact with people and maybe carrying ticks or something like that. For the third level of meadowscaping, we would recommend intervening in a larger space. So first you would cut the lawn to the lowest it can go. You would again have to remove 80% of the turf grass already present there. And we would recommend planting native grasses first. Uh, in a natural meadow, it would be about 60% native grasses and 40% native wildflowers. And we would pl suggest planting actual plants and not seeds for this intervention. These are more likely to survive, even though they are a little bit more expensive. So about 50 to 20 species of native wildflowers. And then we would recommend using creeping thyme on the areas of high foot traffic for the reason that creeping thyme shouldn't grow more than about three inches. So it's not likely to carry ticks. It also has some aesthetic value and it is green all year round and it can be trampled on without dying uh, in the same way as turf grass. And thyme would also help avoid contacts with ticks again because it's much more short growing. And the third site we chose is the solar park near the landfill. Sorry. Uh, the first level for this would, again, be clover seeding, which we got into a little bit more previously, where you would not need to rip out the turf grass, since this is an area that does not have a lot of foot traffic. On the other side of the panels, uh, we think it would be okay to seed the area with clover without having to remove the grass first. For the second level, we would recommend solar grazing, which is where farm animals can graze on the field near the solar park, which we'll get into more in a second. And the third level would be to uh, do a wildflower meadowscaping, similar to the way that we recommended earlier, where you would have to remove 80% of turf grass, which is why this is in the higher tier, because it would have a higher initial cost for the plants and a higher initial level of labor to get the landscape in shape to become a meadow. So for level two, which is solar grazing, uh, some of the benefits of this are that grazing animals can actually increase biodiversity by up to 40%. This can help empower local farmers and build community relationships. It's actually already taking place with Finicky Farm in Northfield. And it's a natural form of mowing where the animals are eating the grass as it gets too tall, which can avoid some of the costs we got into earlier of turf grass. And th this can also help support pollinators. So some of the limitations of our research here are that we were not able to offer more than three recommendations per site. Uh, if we had had more time, it might have been helpful to be able to combine certain recommendations. Like, for example, with something such as Ray Ellerbrook Field, you could have something an area that is in a level one tier recommendation and something that is also in a level two tier recommendation at the same time. Uh, we also recognize our site visits were done during the off season. And so it is possible that the areas we determined were frequented might actually be different during summer months. Uh, we also were not able to fully complete a policy and cost analysis, but uh, we do believe that these recommendations would be would improve significantly on the status quo in terms of pollinator populations, promoting biodiversity, and just creating uh, more usable green spaces for everybody. So some next steps after this project is that we would advise if there was any construction taken from our uh, interventions to create educational signage, uh, somewhat in the way that Smith College has done with the geothermal energy project. This can just keep people informed about why this is happening and the potential benefits of what the space will look like. It can just keep it can also help keep people uh, involved in the process. Uh, we also would recommend to our peers that 
there could be a future capstone on specifically athletic field schools and cemeteries. We understand from the city there is some interest in these spaces, but they're complicated enough to maybe warrant their own project. And of course, uh, we would advise applying these pilot projects to other parcels so that these spaces are suggestions for these specific spaces. But using that map, the city now has access to other areas that have a lot of high potential for transformation. Yeah, so thank you guys all so much for listening and a special thank you to the people with the city government that helped us with this project. And of course, with our professor, Alex Barron and everyone for their help. Thank you. Thanks everyone, that was great. Um, I Again, any questions or comments from the uh, commissioners, especially Rich? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say to you, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I think we could have, uh, we could have, oh, let me just fix my gallery. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that. That was excellent. Um, is it possible to get a copy of that? Yeah, because we're... We've had some requests to um, okay. share results, so we will be sharing the slides and our final paper. Wonderful, and I would like to uh, share that with the city's Urban Forestry Commission. Uh, in particular, I think they would be interested in looking into the Milwaukee Forest. Uh, we have talked about that at other commission meetings and trying to uh, understand that a role is just not trees, but uh, you know everything green in essence. So we're sort of like the green committee, I guess. Uh, but I, I'd be very interested in, in uh, hearing, uh, you know, hearing the, seeing the presentation at a minimum. And if they had any questions, I could, they could email you directly. That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. And and thank you uh, for taking the time to meet with me the other day. I'm kind of long winded, but you put up with me, and I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for taking this time to meet with us. You're one of the many people who helped like propel this project forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again. Any other comments? Yeah, Ben, I, I, I just have one. That was a great presentation. And I, I guess I'm cognizant that the scope of the of the project is is to focus on city owned properties. But for the commission, I think it's important to contemplate how this expands into the full community. Um, many, many folks know today that um, your water bill includes a significant um, charge. Uh, uh, for the unfunded mandate of stormwater control. And I, I just wanna sort of tee this up that it's something, it's something that we should probably work on and think about gathering information about how those you know, expensive green lawns in, in the 20,000 homes you know, that, that are in the city um, can, can adopt these kinds of practices as well. I I myself have contemplated the the, the day where I don't have a, a lawnmower, um, and I think I think it would be beneficial to the to the entire community, including uh, the benefits of of, uh, of rainwater infiltration into these types of um, um, managed areas. And I, I wouldn't say they're wild; they're they're managed areas. Um, and how that might benefit our stormwater uh, issues, because that that you know it's there's actually money involved in that, and we can if we can improve it, we we should work on that. So, kudos to the Smith team for working on the city, um, the city locations um, for the commission. I think this isn't the end of the story. I think we need to think about how how this extends to all grassed areas in in the city. That 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 may. Uh, maybe potential sites for this. So thank you. So Eric, I think your insights is really good. So there's there was another team from the same capstone group that looked at uh, municipal properties that could do green infrastructure to deal with stormwater. So precisely that problem. And I would say, and they did a great job and they're just not able to present today. The key takeaway from their work was that there's no way we can do it with city owned impervious surfaces. Like we just don't have, we don't control enough surface area. And so like it's so that in fact, privately owned land really is where this happens. And um, the, the same insight that you had that actually this menu of choices should be made accessible to more people in the city. And we should figure out ways to uh, to encourage people to to take advantage of it, to you know, to make it culturally more acceptable, all those things that we'd need to do 
um, I, I think that's stuff we discussed is stuff uh, um, that did come up with this other group as well that weren't produced. Yeah, I would add to that too, Eric, um, from what Ben was just saying that um, just to emphasize that what the team found out was that it's actually more impactful to be um, changing impervious surfaces than it would be to just um, already green lawn spaces in terms of like the groundwater recharge and just the capturability. So, um, but yeah, that's a really good point. I think I, think I mentioned a um, couple of, me well, I can't remember when, but we, we've talked about um, replacing uh, paved parking areas with using pervious concrete structures. And, you know, the city itself could look at ways of incentivizing that, right? So somebody replaces their paved driveway with impervious, with pervious uh, cement structures, you know, gets a different, gets a different water bill, right? Gets a, gets a different stormwater surcharge piece on their, on their property. So, I mean, I think there are, I think there are things to, to work on on this area as well. And Angie? Yeah, I just wanted to give thanks to you guys for doing this presentation. And um, I was able to speak with Karen um, afterwards yesterday, but I just wanted to um, share with the group and also the commission is already aware that we're, um, you know, trying to support the environmental club at the Northampton High School, who's also looking at um, a slope tail. And so I'm excited that some of them are able to join today and see your presentation and just really great work. So thank you for sharing all these ideas and all the kind of like groundwork that would be needed to really share with the city stakeholders and staff. And you've kind of really set um, a good foundation for them to be able to kind of continue on to with their interest and aim. So thank you so much for focusing on this. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. It's good to hear. Uh, are there any other commissioner comments or questions? Uh, anyone from the public? Uh, Adele. Uh I found this presentation extremely interesting, and I would like to suggest that um, a forum be held for community members to hear about this and also uh, to hear about how they can transform their lawns. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So you guys aren't graduating for a little while, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh that's right yeah that, that's right congratulations <laughs> um okay uh, are there any other comments or questions for the smith college teams if not and because we 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 lost some time early on uh i'd love to move to the next agenda item with national grid uh and Bob Ide is here. Um, so uh, the, at our last meeting and meetings before that, um, we had a lot of questions about um, challenges with uh, capacity for uh, for uh, photovoltaics being added, challenges for capacity for heat pumps in certain locations, um, and uh, just inter, inter interconnection challenges generally uh, in residential areas. And um, so Bob Eid uh, and I guess William Kern are here. And so I'd hand it over to you guys. Absolutely, just wanted to do a sound check, Ben. Can you hear me? I hear you. Oh, perfect. So um, we'll, we'll walk through this a little bit briefly and then we'll really open it up for questions and, and comments. And we'll try to go through this as efficiently as possible today. So um, just, a little bit of an agenda. Uh, I'll introduce myself. I'll have Will introduce himself. We'll get a, a brief understanding of the electrical system at large uh, and how that operates down from the generation level to the customer level. And then we'll pass it off to Will to essentially articulate different interconnections. And then we could open it up for questions. So with that being said, uh, my name is Robert Ide. You could call me Bob. I'm the municipal uh, relations manager for Northampton. Uh, the term is called community manager. Uh, I've oversee 31 communities in Western Massachusetts and uh, run the relationships with those communities. Um, Will, how about you introduce yourself? Can you hear me okay? Yes, you can, sir. Awesome, thank you. So I'm Will Kern. I'm the manager for our large-scale DG uh, interconnection group. 
uh, here at National Grid. So I've been with National Grid for 25 years. I've been spending uh, seven going on eight years here in this uh, this position and, and working through this stuff. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the um, the interconnection processes that exist and you know, kind of hopefully uh, get some questions I can answer for you guys. Perfect. Thank you, Will. Uh, all right. So let's just speak from a really high level on what the electrical system is. Just because there's uh, vocabulary that's tossed around, I want to ensure that we are speaking common language when questions are being thrown out today. So the, the traditional electrical system is based in, in a few distinct parts. The first is generation. We see that in large scale solar. We see that in, um, well, not, not so much coal anymore, uh, some nuclear. There's a whole variety of generation mix that exists in the world today. And that steps up into what we refer to as transmission. Now, transmission for national grid is uh, classified as 69,000 volts and above. Uh, assets in New England go all the way up to 345 kV, in some cases 4, 450, uh, but that's a DC circuit that links us with Canada. The transmission system is essentially the backbone that ties the electrical grid together. And they take energy from that generation and source it to substations. And those substations then step down that electricity into what we refer to as distribution. Uh, distribution is broken up into multiple pieces, but we can easily say that you have a substation, feeders come out of that substation, and those get stepped down into our everyday businesses, homes, et cetera. So I just want to give a breakdown there. So we have generation, transmission, and then distribution. Distribution is, you know, just kind of give a base level here. It's what you see in the street. Uh, it's what we deal with every day. Uh, transmission, that gets thrown around a lot when we speak about the electrical grid. That's high voltage. It's a little bit different of an animal. Uh, most folks don't really have any interaction with that unless you're a very large industrial customer. There's only one or two situations that across our system. Uh, so that just brings us on a very high level of the electrical system overall. I uh, just want to stop there. Does anybody have any quick questions about the electrical system? Uh, because today, and, and it's important to specify that we are talking about you know, a very simplified model with DER, that energy is flowing bi-directional. Uh, and that's something that we as a company are excited about working with and provides very unique challenges and also some excitement for us uh, as we walk through you know, this growing complexity of the electrical system as we have. So any quick questions there on the electrical system? I do want to- uh, make Bob, sure just, just a clarification. Yes, Eric, um, please. There, there is generation buried in distribution as opposed to directly connected to transmission. So it's important for folks to understand there's wholesale and yep. as well as, as, um, as non-wholesale uh, generation in the distribution mm -hmm. system. That's, that's that, that the is DER that he was talking about, right? That the, the, the yes. acronym distributed yeah. energy resources <laughs> yeah, D, yeah there so yeah. i'm sorry national grid we believe in a number of acronyms and i a lot of them are industry specific and i assume everyone knows and uh, i tend to let that one pass by but eric you're absolutely correct that especially in today's world we do have a lot of distribution uh distributed assets that are on that system that are pushing into the system uh today uh, and that's when we get talking about host capacity and different issues that come up on that front uh, so I'm going to pass this off to Will. Will, I, I would love for you to kind of give a highlight, if you would, on the different interconnections that are available to customers, uh, especially for photovoltaic and um, you know battery storage, I would say, if you could, please. Yeah, yeah. So trying to keep it high level, I apologize for my voice. It's uh, that time of year, I think, for most of us, right? It's, <laughs> yes, we all tend to get sick, so... Um, so just to touch on, you know, there's three different paths, right? There, there there's a tariff that that kind of dictates the DG or DER. Uh, so DG is is distributed generation. DER is distributed energy resources. Um, the difference between those two, right, is as we've seen more batteries come on board, you start to get into the DER term, right? Because batteries aren't actually generating anything, right? They 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 can be charged and discharged. Um, so we're starting to use the term DER a little bit more often where, you know, we talk about all the solar and wind and everything we've done, the, the hydro and various different uh, combined heat and power type uh, resources. Those were more distributed generation as they are creating uh, that generation. So there's the difference between those terms. Uh, we, we have a tariff that drives um, the process for interconnection. 
uh, on those. And the tariff is there uh, as sort of, um, you know, sort of the, the rule book or, or the guide to keep us all on the same page because, um, you know, there's a number of parties that have to factor in, right? There's the development community uh, everywhere from the, the guys I'm see, sure you guys have seen walking up and down the streets, knocking on doors, selling residential solar uh, to larger scale, right? Whether it's rooftop, canopy or, you know, large ground mounted type solar, um, right? So, so we have the, the tariff there to kind of set the rules of engagement, create the expectation for us as the utility and for them as a developer and to kind of keep things fair because at the end of the day, National Grid's money comes from ratepayers, and we want to make sure that we're not unfairly charging ratepayers for work that uh, could and should be being paid for by uh, the develop the DG development community that would be um, you know, taking advantage of and, um, <coughs> excuse me, and, and, uh, and making money off of these systems that are being installed. So, um, so we work through, through that tariff. There's three, there's three interconnection paths. There's, uh, what we call the simplified path, which is residential solar capped out at 25 KW, um, you know, generally, you know, in residential neighborhoods on rooftops, um, right. That process is streamlined. It does go much, much quicker. Um, right, the application process through interconnection, depending on how quickly uh, the sites can be installed, could be you know a few weeks to a few months, uh, depending on how quickly that can move. We have a middle path we call it the expedited path. Um, it uh, it's for I would tell medium sized projects, so projects that are larger than twenty five. Uh, site a size doesn't necessarily dictate path. Uh, it, it exactly. There's a lot of complexity that, that goes into certain types of interconnections where they are. Uh, but this is, you know, for things that are larger than 25 kW, but sort of less complex, right? Things that we can connect to our system a little bit more easily, either depending on the type of connection it is or where it is connected. And then the largest, um, which is called the standard path, right? But is the most complex. Um, you know, that's that's what we reserve for those larger scale commercial industrial type interconnections in addition to those larger scale ground mounted, right, you know, solar fields. Um, you know, that can take several years to kind of start the process and work through the interconnection process at that time to kind of make that happen. A lot of complexity that works through here. We've seen a lot of saturation in national grid territory. Uh, we, we had a lot of success over the last 10 years or so where um, the SMART program, Solar Mass Renewable Target, right, came about in 2018, right after Thanksgiving. And uh, we saw a lot of work being driven by that incentive, uh, very heavily incentivized, one of the best in the country. We saw uh, developers coming in from all, all over the, the country to kind of participate in our uh, interconnection process here. So based on that success, we've seen a lot of saturation and, and we're now in sort of, um, a period of time where things are a little bit more difficult to get connected. All that low hanging fruit uh, is, is kind of gone. And, uh, you know, we are seeing a large or longer duration um, interconnection processes as we move forward. So uh, I'm sure that some of that stuff, right, has trickled down to impact uh, whether it's town sites or whether it's uh, residents or, or businesses that are, that are in town there uh, have seen things maybe cost a little bit more. Um, or take a little bit longer than they had anticipated as we've, uh, like I said, I, I, I like to put it as it's success, right? It's success for all of us. We had a lot of work come in. We connected a lot of DG, uh, 2.6 gigawatts total in national grid territory here in Massachusetts. So quite a bit of D DG that's come online over the years. So I'll tell pause and happy to answer any questions. I think that last bit that you brought up about saturation is probably the the thing that is bringing bringing our, this to our attention um yeah. and i think eric you probably could talk about your experience and ask some pretty direct questions i think yeah well i mean my for, first of all you're well you're talking about you're not talking about the oat in terms of the tariff you're talking about a different tariff relative to interconnection yeah, we have a distribution level, Massachusetts okay. specific, right? Tariff, yeah, so that, interconnection tariff. So, so just so folks understand, there's another there's another interconnection process for for uh, facilities in excess of you know a megawatt in size that or, or and or if there's already 
a, a wholesale generator on the system that has to um, um, go through what's known as the open access transmission tariff, which is administered by the ISO. But let me, I, 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 I digress. The, the issue that, that I had sort of raised with Ben and why we kind of wanted to have a conversation is that it's, it's becoming evident and I've been aware, you know, I worked in this sector for a, quite, quite some time, about a decade. And um, it's becoming evident that the distribution system in its, in its current uh, uh, design and functionality is experiencing uh, uh, the stressors of having uh, a, a different direction of flow of, of electrons. And that's causing uh, the necessity I believe that the distribution system needs needs to be modified to accommodate more and more bidirectional flow um, as a result of of distributed energy resources being located in in the system. So one of the things that we're interested in understanding, first of all, is if you could characterize who's responsible for uh, the cost of those upgrades to deal with. Um, uh, um, the stress system, which I'm assuming you're looking at distribution lines and saying, what does it have? What does it mean to have another 25 kilowatts flowing back on this on this line? And and also for us to understand, if you can, where where in our city um, you you expect to see uh, um, uh, more and more issues relative to interconnection. That is that you know. There needs to be upgrades paid for um, in order in order to inter in, interconnect, um, and I, I think that's I think I'll, I'll I'll stop there. But that's that's part of the thing that we're interested in in understanding because it goes counter to our intent to have more and more people have have uh, self generation. Um, I think the state also has that same that that same goal. And yet here we are with a system that was designed 50, 60 years ago for unidirectional flow through the substation and out the fires and, and, and uh, um, not, not, where, not where we are, where we are today. So I'll, 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 I'll cease there. I'll let you see if you can respond. Hey, Eric, um, I do wanna make a few comments uh, based on the initial part of your question. Uh, is essentially around who's paying for uh, upgrades for our electrical system that we have today. And National Grid does understand that the electrical system does need to be um, built for the future. The, the, the term that I like to use is right-sizing for what's coming down the pike. And our state understands this as well. And what happened last year was there was a, a climate law that was put in place, and forgive me for not remembering the specific name of the case, although what came about was what is known as the Electric Sector Modernization Plan, and that stands for ESM, yeah, the, the acronym's ESMP. The ESMP was a mandate that electrical distribution companies across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts look at the electrical system today, we look at it five years out, 10 years out, and by 2050, and identify all the state goals and all of what we're seeing from load growth across the system and identify a plan to meet those needs. Now that was passed through a, uh, an advisory committee known as the GMAC. Uh, forgive me for not remembering what that stands for. Although the GMAC did a review to ensure that what we were proposing was also in line as much as we were, that the ratepayer was not gonna receive a massive blow on this. Now, the ESMP was approved by the state of Massachusetts, and it's fantastic because it's a future-looking document, and it's a future-looking um, case. So what we begin doing uh, now, uh, since that has been approved, is acquiring assets such as transformers and uh, starting to execute on the projects that we have across the state of Massachusetts to build out that electrical system, which will increase capacity and will facilitate more DER interconnections across the state. So that's, that's one piece of the puzzle there. And excuse me, when it comes to uh, a interconnector that wants to come in, and this is now a, and we'll 
please don't let me go too far off the rails here. Uh, if I'm not speaking about rooftop solar, but if you have a, a solar project that wants to come in the area, any upgrades that are that are needed to facilitate that that solar farm is on behalf of that customer who's connecting to the electrical system. Well, I, I didn't speak out of turn there, correct? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think so. I think. Okay. Um, Thank you. You know, I, I, I want to say that one of, one of the biggest conversations I have is around cost. Right. And, you know, who's paying for what and who's driving what what cost. And and um, you know, it's been a, a major discussion for for years and years and years. There was a docket with the DPU it was 1975. So it started pre pandemic. Um, and a lot of the discussion was just around um, sort of cost sharing methodology.